Um, okay. So what do you mean? I I wonder what you mean with uh, something like this. Uh, well, you were mentioning um, uh, uh, placing yourself within an institutional framework um, and to do something that's to do a project or an activities that are uninstitutional or unconventional in there, in that sense. Um, and and you were talking about this idea of the friction between what you would expect and what the hosts would expect and i i find that really really interesting i mean i would i would love to get involved in something like that um but it, you know it's like i was saying it's just it feels always a little bit elusive and a little bit difficult and maybe something that's also uh tricky to get long-term um gains out of Be because you feel you're being tokenized then i feel the tokenism is a is a big problem yeah Be because be specifically because it doesn't it rarely allows you to build upon something um, uh, practical. I mean, it, it, obviously, any opportunity, if we deal with it in the right way, allows us to advance our practice, to advance our thinking, to, you know, whatever, gain experience and, and learn how to manage situations and, and engage with people, etc. But um, I really, I'm so tired of um, so so many like NGO style projects that come with certain um, uh, uh, goals, right, and 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 ideas, and and ultimately don't manage to leave a trace that is meaningful that can be built upon. And because I, I I tend to feel like we're just going around in circles so so often in the cultural sphere, whether it be with conversations or with practice or you know, with, with, with frameworks, everything feels like we're just repeating ourselves and not really listening to the right people in order to break some of these cycles and actually get somewhere. And then I, I, know, I start to realize maybe these cycles are what's intended in order to keep people and, and things in their place. And this mm -hmm. is where the kind of political element of things starts to, to come to the surface. And can you give an example if you say like NGO style projects? I don't know you might have something that uh, you know aims at trying whatever like capacity building right we want to try to um okay i'll give you a great example actually um about 10 years ago more than that i was involved in a i, I tried to instigate a project that would create a digital sound archive uh, as part of the national library in baghdad and there was already a um uh, uh, an understanding, like a, a cooperation between the National Library in Baghdad and the British Library in London. And so I managed to get a small amount of funding and convince the British Library to invite two members of staff from the Baghdad uh, li National Library to do training in um, uh, um, uh, uh, sound archiving, right? So everything yes. from how to clean shellac discs to how to bake and digitize uh, uh, magnetic tape all this kind of stuff for three and a half months and i was part of it i was unpaid everybody else was getting paid and i was there translating working um you know preparing documents being around etc etc and it was a really great initiative we were like on the cusp of having two people that had a very strong understanding of how to deal with digital data with analog data all of this stuff and to, to start instigating a a massive um, digitization effort in baghdad with a, a bunch of tapes half of which had already been bombed right mm. and uh, once that project was over um it ticked all the boxes everybody was very happy we did a couple of presentations the website blogs went up online and then that was it i was unable to get any more funding to actually sustain the project and support it because nobody was interested all the the the, the parties that were part of this thing all they wanted was just to represent to present that fireworks show as an initiative that was being done that was helping this you know uh, new uh, revival of the national library in baghdad but nobody was really committed to the long-term process. And if you say nobody, is that then the funding? And where does the funding come from? Everywhere. From the European the European Union, we're not interested. I was working with a bunch of different NGOs from Italy and um, and France. Um, the British Library was not interested. Any Nobody else in the UK was interested. The only way it could have happened was for me to continue these kind of personal project-style funding applications and try to keep 
pushing these weird angles rather than be able to say, look, you know, this is an institutional thing that, that requires uh, um, the, a, a certain proper support, you know, in order just to, to pilot the idea, just to get it off the ground and see where it might go, you know. So you mean personal that then the, the the way to find money would be to say I'm an artist this is my my project fund me or yeah or oh I'm doing this research into whatever like sound archiving in mm -hmm. times of war you know but like, meaning through you like to yeah. through through you as a as a almost like as a how do you call it like a fund or like um that you give exactly yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and you were mentioning to me the other day the the idea of storytelling right of fiction. Mm -hmm. I found this really, really fascinating because from from my experiences, <clears throat> something, for example, you know, this example we were just talking about now, in order for me to get it off the ground, what I would have to do is tell the story of, well, I am so and so I was, you know, m my family's Iraqi, I was born in Damascus, I was raised in London, we were refugees, and now I'm doing this and now I'm interested in sound and music. And, and uh, I want to do some research about this particular subject, which is, Blah blah, and I would have to tell this story in order to make it somehow feel interesting for, mm -hmm. for people, in order to then to be able to find the funding and to to right. push the project forward. And I'm just tired of doing that because there are certain issues that I, I feel don't need to have that fiction, uh, that character at the center in order to drive them. There is a a greater uh, need that is beyond one person. And one person's ability to maintain that story too, you know. Yeah. What you say about um, what you say makes me think of something we were discussing earlier. That I used to have a practice where the storytelling would be, where I would like, let's say five, six, seven years ago, I I did a couple of projects that were um, really like fictional institutions that I would make inside existing institutions, and. The, Maybe I talk a bit about one because I don't understand it anymore so good. So it's nice to use this talk as to look into something that I that I don't understand so good anymore. Like I I I worked in in the National History Museum of Brussels. Um, I was somehow invited by not by them by by some, by, by the, an art center to do something, and then I ended up there, and I found out that the National History Museum of Brussels was supposed to have two wings, and they only built one wing. And the other wing, which was to be um, uh, holding a certain collection that never built. And then I decided to build um, to build that wing to so to add it uh, in temporarily with scaffolding, open air, no climatization, no roof, but 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 still quite uh, big. And then st I made a collection that somehow was an addition to their collection. Um, and then the people would come and see it, and we made a bridge from the wing through a through a, a window of the of the museum, um, and half of our budget went to the security person who would stand at the window to check that no one would go from my. So this 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 bridge became interesting then because uh, not only did we have to invest in security so that hmm, the membrane of the museum wouldn't be uh, opened uh, problematically. But also they insisted that we put a panel saying, hi, dear visitor of the museum, you're entering an artwork. So you're leaving the, the zone of verifi ver verified science and you go into art. And then I, it was one month before the opening. I said, okay, what do we have to do to not have this sign? Um, and then they said, yeah, then it has to be true, everything you do and every, scientifically true. And uh, so then we hired, with the rest of the budget, we hired uh, sciences, scientists and we also worked with them to check everything we would do. And then finally, we managed to get this panel away um, because what we were showing was was then verified or something. And this, let it, I think this was quite essential to the work to, 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 to somehow be a fictional institution um, and to from that position of fiction start interfering with the with uh, with the real instead the real yeah or to show from a point of fiction institution show the fiction inside the other uh, i don't want to go into detail but one thing i learned from what you said about um the feeling of being tokenized which is a feeling i uh, i i don't know um what i realized is that as me a white man from from here um, 
in going into into an institution with nothing more in my hands than fiction and a narrative one of the big tools that i have is that i can become easily that fictional character which is already produced by the institution namely the white scientist the white male uh, western scientist who makes a collection and i can start playing that figure and this goes for many works that i made like this um, and you other fictions that i created inside national theaters where i could become where somehow i could easily fit a pre-existing idea of what someone who works in a place like this looks like so thank you for that because it's it's helping me to understand also the problematic of the ease with which i can use fictions i mean it's interesting you bring that up because um i think we all we all tend to do that anyway we we all i think we're pushed into actually taking on those kinds of characters like i was saying earlier i, I in in many situations i've been in i'm pushed into taking on the character of the ex-refugee child who has managed to put themselves through university and is now a semi-successful you know artist going around doing their things who has these ideas and has these projects you know that are whatever socially uh, uh, relevant in some shape or form right mm -hmm. um as opposed to um and and that's the and, and by by being put in that category or or by being um, push to take on that character it's very hard to just be oneself and it's very hard to actually um, get away from this character driven narrative like we were talking about earlier and and allow the work and the needs and the desires you know the imagination to lead as opposed to this you know um, um, leading figure and, mm. and and I guess that's something we also touched upon in our conversations the other day, which I would like to follow up with you on is this idea of how can one create something that is decentralized by nature, that doesn't rely on a figurehead that is there driving the thing the entire time, especially within these kinds of frameworks that ultimately need to have the, that kind of figurehead character taking on predefined roles um, mm. it's a very it's a question that i'm dealing with at the moment because um i'm currently in my fourth fifth year of being the artistic director of a self-created fiction that is becoming real like i hired an atelier called it decor atelier started doing stuff and now four or five years later it's uh, it looks pretty real it has like people on the payroll it has you know people have to, there's like containers for trash there is uh, a list where you put your stripe when you ate something and there is like you know there's there's over hours and there's uh, uh, who takes holiday when you know it looks like a real thing and um this summer I was really not doing good. Like I, uh, we had bad news about subsidies and I was really crashing a bit and um, com yeah, close to, I think a burnout. Uh, and I know that a lot of people who, who actually are in a burnout say that they are close to it. So that might have be the case with me as well. And I ran into to, um, to Rafat who, who uh, introduced us. And I, I had like a half an hour or something. Okay. <laughs> so we were in completely different planets. And uh, I was telling him, uh, stressed about how I'm giving power away and how I'm finally having younger people taking over and that it's not about me anymore. My That Decor Atelier is, doesn't need me anymore. And, and I was telling him a story about, you know, what the solution would be uh, for my feeling of, too much pressure and too much heavy things on my shoulders and so i was telling about this young two young three young people who are doing so good and who are kind of taking more responsibility and rafa didn't buy it he was saying like um i don't know man it's sounds like it's still your thing <laughs> like something like this and and it i needed a few weeks to to realize that 
that he was probably a little bit right and that me as a storyteller i was still telling still telling the story of how i am letting my power go or of how young people taking over and i think what i'm learning is that um that i that if it if and to answer your question or to do to, to go back to this that if decentralization is happening i'm not gonna be the one telling that story mm. by by definition yeah i mean it makes perfect sense because if if an idea is allowed to be itself without needing to 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 be um fronted by a personality then then there would be no need in the first place for for a first person voice mm. to telling that story but if you know as i try to think about this a lot and and you know read about new developments like decentralized autonomous organizations in the web3 uh, kind of new um frameworks and um and think about the potentials for things and try to read up and connect with some of the more lefty anarchist berlin networks um political networks to find out more about these activism networks that 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 have a cause as their um frontispiece as opposed to a personality and i find it you know more and more difficult to 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 imagine something like that because i think the the structures and the systems within which arts and culture and activism and social justice and everything else w- within which they work they require they you know they demand a first person voice personality that is telling the story and if it's to be a, a a small group of people who are doing that then then those small group of people also need to um uh Uh, it be in agreement on a specific narrative and on a specific story and and therefore as a group take on the representation of you know what was once one mm. and obviously i think for for women this is a, a completely different story also and it has many other layers so um it's 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 difficult to to think about these things outside of the impact that and and the imposition of the kind of systemic structures that we're working within it is and i've been making temporary spaces and temporary associations of people sometimes more fiction sometimes less fiction sometimes more performance driven or product driven sometimes more research driven but what i've never done is to make an organization or, or an organigram that in itself is like radically different than all the other institutions so i noticed that i've i've never done a horizontal organization um what why do you think that is it, it didn't happen it was not a conscious choice but i think i'm not interested in being the exception um i don't want to prove everyone wrong by doing it more horizontal because um because i want it to be functional i work together with since 20 years with a uh, technician engineer builder best friend uh, who is obsessed with functionality he's just really good in organizing stuff it would be very disloyal to him to force a horizontal decision structure on upon him so so the, the my atelier is not a horizontal it's not horizontal mm-hmm. and I, and i i noticed that i noticed that to that a lot of people call my the, the place i run uh somehow like f- a fictional example or something and i i think it's too much pressure i think it's better to call it logical consequence i think the way i the my choice to go into an old factory without heating and to 
to to to look for funding and then is produced by the arts institutional context in which i work the opportunities but also the impossibilities so it is closely connected it is intertwined it is an embrace a violent embrace sometimes but it's not it's not an, i'm not making a, a beautiful like, exception that is shining so bright that it it um it's not um it's not an exception i don't want it to be an exception I, I find it really interesting that you use that word because i was thinking a lot recently about um how i how i always felt myself at on the margins of very different margins all the time i i felt like i've always been somehow uh, um yeah at, in marginal spaces and often on the margins of margins so things becoming more and more niche but it's it's never it's never felt to me like it's been in one single direction and and i don't i don't see that as or i have i've been struggling to see that as a strength and then i started reading recently some writings by bell hooks about um the margin actually the, the potential of the margin to be a center and how from the margins one's able to embrace a different you know perspectives and different ideas and find strength in that in that uniqueness mm. but then i think like you were saying um with regards to the exception in order to 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 fully embrace that exception or or that marginality then one also needs to be able to commit to that marginality to being that exception mm. and and um and therefore deal with the pressure that comes with that because inevitably you're rubbing against the grain you know you're 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 walking against the the, the tide against the wind that or, or or you know whatever we could i'm trying to think of metaphors but if you you know you you have streams that move in particular directions because that's the way these streams have been constructed and if you decide mm -hmm. you actually want to do things differently then you're always going to be going up against that friction mm -hmm. and that's what becomes exhausting after a while and i think i mean i find figures like bell hooks who were able to kind of push against that Th those mainstream narratives and and find strength in the margin and be able to put forward proposals that are actionable right um really really fascinating because it's it's not just about the value of her ideas it's also about her strength as a character to mm -hmm. be able to find the, the 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 willpower to maintain that kind of narrative and 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 I don't know if I can if I can have that same kind of commitment, to be honest with you, because I've tried in the past and ultimately I've just burnt out, literally, you know, um, literally burnt out and taken many, many, many months to to recover from it. And the 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 this is why I started thinking more about group based work because I feel like when there's just when you're one person trying to drive something trying to drive an idea which essentially is you know an exception in its in its shape or form then it's um then the amount of energy required is just unbearable and can you tell us more about, or can you tell me more about it um what what that group would be like just if you could imagine if you could just yeah maybe you just dive into the fiction which is my speciality yeah i mean in what you're you're asking me, I guess, for the kind of ideal scenario, right? If I was, mm -hmm. what what I'm, what I'm imagining, what would yes. be the ideal situation? And I would I would love to see you know a, a transdisciplinary group of um, actors actresses um, that w work together on research and 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 practical outcomes. So we can call them products if you want. Um, th within which the the responsibilities are dynamic in the sense that you know there isn't a single person that has a, a, a um, an, an extra weight load of labor that mm -hmm. they have to participate in all the time. That the that the amount of labor can be dynamic and can be shared across different people 
Um, but that can also fluctuate at different times because I also don't believe that anything can be really horizontal the whole time. It needs to, you know, this dynamicism is something that's that's vital. And we can't have just one person in charge of one thing. And, and therefore, when there's a lot of work in one period, they need to field all of that stress. And then when there isn't, they have nothing to do. So they end up doing a bunch of other things. And I think it's, it's kind of unhealthy. So um, this is why I imagine a, a group of, of, of people thinking together, experimenting together, allowing the imagination to, to, to um, be... Uh, invigorated and, mm. and and to let let the imagination and the ideas lead rather than than a specific figure or, or a specific uh, discourse lead and then you know create things that have a longevity to them that 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 can remain even when you know the, the whole idea collapses in some shape or form mm. so i'm talking about it in a very abstract way just because i don't want to you know single out specifics no no it's it's in it's in, interesting to hear and and for you when when you mention about um not wanting to be the exception is there a, a reason for that in your mind mm. yes because i'm not interested in the narrative um for example we have like every year we have a budget for sanding and varnishing because it's quite expensive varnish and if but if you don't sand and varnish things which are standing outside on the courtyard they start looking like a squat and this is very problematic because not only um because most of all the people of the neighborhood um they, it it's not so nice if things are like old wood and rusty it's not so safe for kids but also it starts looking a lot like squats that i visited in the 90s uh, or beginning of the of this millennium in berlin and 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 rusty iron and and i'm i'm i really don't want the associations with something that is like anti because it's not true most of all like we are we are not uh we are not uh, an artist run organization with no funding i don't want to look like it also i so i i really feel like it's it's important if i'm talking about the way it, the thing is i would i would actually not mind being an institution and like i it's not really cool to have no heating, for example. It's not something I love in the winter to be like, oh, wow, we don't have heating. I also, you know, it's nice to have a, a storage space. It's so nice. What, a storage. Why, yes. yeah, why do you feel like that binary exists of either you can be non-institutional and be cold or you, or in order to be warm, you have to be an institution? Well, it's a little bit how it feels in, in here. Like, up till now it still is the better deal for now maybe it will change maybe my if if maybe maybe the work changes and i can take over things i don't know but for now it seems still a good deal to be a bit cold in the winter and to have more autonomy that's still okay that means it feels like a good deal with to also to have a temporary contract for two or two years in a building that's going to be converted and then have to pay not so much rent it feels still like a good deal because the other option is going for a 10-year contract in a nicely heated building it then i will have to write dossiers where i promise that the next 10 years we are going to be a vibrant neighborhood center with this amount of people coming this amount of times to do this amount of workshops and i just don't want to do that that's the part of institutionalization i don't do that i don't don't then i lose everything so for now there is in in my practice and in on the ground there is an opposition. So I don't want to be. But. Yeah. So l late last year, I um, a friend of mine who's involved in some um, quite radical like activist networks here um, let me know about a space that was becoming available in this 
big you know huge old school building that was um that's basically the home to a lot of activist networks in in berlin the old school like leftist activist networks and uh this the building was supposed to be sold for property development you know the usual you know real estate stuff that's been going on all over the world and um and the those who were there managed to create a massive campaign and raise uh, a million euros and convince the Senate of Berlin to buy the the building and therefore not be evicted and to stay there. And they were starting now to refurbish the entire place and to start thinking about renting out specific areas, uh, specific, you know, parts of it. And and I heard about one that was um, going to be available. And immediately I jumped on the opportunity to try and apply. The reason that I wanted to apply is because this space the contract for this space would was like 65 years or something mm. that's what excited me about it it was wow. the longevity knowing that if we take it, and i wasn't going to do it on my own i spoke to a few friends and we were trying to think about how we can make it happen and but that was the thing that was the most exciting one it was a co-op so we would be buying into a co-op and two our lease on this space would have been 65 years and wow. and i found for me that that longevity was way more enticing and exciting than finding a space that had a two or three year lease or even a five year lease. This idea that, ah, we could get into a place and know that we could like surrender to building something over time without having the stress of maybe being kicked out and having to go elsewhere. Um, and that that drove an idea in me for well okay how can i make this financially viable it's it was quite expensive by berlin standards expensive but by you know modern european capital standards not expensive at all but still it would have been a stress of trying to find whatever 5000 euros a month uh, to to pay rent right well, but I started thinking, well, if we have this kind of space, we could build these kinds of units and invite these kinds of people and do these kinds of activities and do these kinds of partnerships and blah, blah, blah. And somehow, you know, it could happen. But I, I, there was, if it wasn't for that lease and for this, this co-op idea, I, I don't think I would have even batted an eyelid. I would have just, you know, ignored altogether because permanence seems so elusive these days like a proper what? grounding what does it mean elusive uh something that's really um transient so is that so permanence is is a good thing then for me i think so yeah i'm i'm very um i'm exhausted by by putting a lot of energy into trying to create something that that mm. is beyond just me and myself that that serves some kind of cultural societal purpose whether it be the the project of the sound archive um yeah. <coughs> excuse me or my record label or um you know the 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 recent projects i did with these uh, browser based tools and all the workshops and everything there's just so much energy that ends up getting put into bringing something like this to life and then um, at at some point, there's just no more energy left to to maintain it because it just it's it's impossible to to maintain that alone and within these frameworks where you're always fighting against something. Whereby, but 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 I felt like if I had if I had the opportunity of a stable space that I know I can rely on, I know when I put my when I you know sign that paper, that's I don't have to worry about this as long as i can keep up with the payments and, and make sure things are right. moving, then i don't have to stress about one day this you know falling apart um, right that's interesting that you mentioned falling apart because when i hear you talking about this sort of kind of desire or or, or flirting within the idea of something that is steady and and 65 years then then i'm um then i'm thinking that would be horrible for me you know and um and then of course i'm also thinking that uh where that that it's probably rare on this planet to be in such a privileged position that you look for instability uh, and and shy away or the run away from permanence 
Um, on the other hand, I have sleep sleepless nights from the fear of things falling apart. Um, so this this feeling of that 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 feeling of of of, of I don't want the, whatever it is that I'm building, really building, but also metaphorically building, to fall apart. Um, one thing I I maybe want to add or or. or put out put there and see what it means what how it resonates is that i feel like a lot of the work i put into the work into the association into my work is to 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 train to train the muscle to be able or i'm sorry i'm making it too complicated i think what we are good at in and what i am good at probably and what what the people i work with are good at is to shape ourselves after the building so there is a building there is an there's a building there is an invitation there is a there's a opportunity there's a question and those three things are often related question building invitation the question that building that invitation expresses a desire and then how can you train yourself to be to be able to take shape after that question building desire and this i think for me is the essence of what i what i want to do it is interesting to hear you say that because um from from i mean i grew up like my 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 adolescent years were spent playing drums in in diy bands right mm -hmm. rock bands metal bands progressive rock bands and i've always i guess because of my history also i've always had this ability to adapt to situations to places to environments um and therefore um yeah just be, be i know how to how to engage with external things and so i feel like somehow a lot of what i've been trying to do over the last few years is is the opposite of that where i'm actually trying to create something in spite of this whatever you know dynamicism or constant movement and uprooting and change and and everything else um and it's always been it's always been really difficult to to, um, to find the balance between an opportunity right something that comes up and, mm. and somehow captures your imagination or really digging deep inside and trying to think well what what do i really want like what do i want to do what wh why do i feel the need to try and create something that can leave a trace mm. why is there this desire for um i know i called it permanence earlier but i i don't know i don't know how how permanent in reality like psychologically i've been thinking about things but um it's more why why there's this desire to just leave something a trace of something that is accessible over time um and is that also referring to commissioned work and self-started work is that is that on that line as well i think so i mean i maybe one of the pressures i put on myself is always to try and create something that I am proud of enough that the and and that engages with its reality enough that it can stand on its own two feet over time. So so if I go back to something ten or fifteen years later, I would like to know that it, you know it somehow contributed in a, in a meaningful way. So I don't know. For example, I did a film soundtrack a few years ago about uh, in Tunisia when I just after I was living there, and the film was about a band. And I was, you know, brought on as a composer to write the music for the band. But I went way beyond, you know, the call of duty and not only wrote the music, but, you know, I helped with uh, with casting the musicians and the actors and working with the DOPs and the lighting designers of the different spaces. And how can we organize the production schedule so that everybody's comfortable? And I produced and I worked as a roadie and I dealt with the live sound recording and then I mixed the record and I mixed the the uh, uh, studio versions of the songs. And I, I just put so much effort into this thing because I thought this is an opportunity to create something that can remain, that mm -hmm. can tell a certain kind of story 
and and I don't want to miss out on this opportunity. But at, at the same time, if I had put half the effort in, I think we would have still achieved the same result. Right. But for me, it felt much more important to go all the way and to, to deal with it as uh, with as much love for the future as as it was love for the present moment. Mm. And um, I still which, haven't managed to unpack that. Yeah. Which which film was it? It was a film called As I Open My Eyes by the Tunisian director Leila Bouzid. Mm. Um, and to this day, people, when they watch that film, they don't realize that that music was made for the film. They think it was a band that already existed. Right. Which for me is like a testament to the, the amount of energy that was put into that in order yeah. to make it feel that way. But ultimately, it's so, it's, it's so marginal. It's so niche. It's so transient. It's just a film, you know? Um, and I, I fluctuate between this. It's just a film. And then, and then going, actually, no, it's not just a film. It's a, a very specific film about a very specific period in the history of that country and how young people were feeling in this very crazy, you know, uh, uh, political upheaval. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a social commentary. It's a political commentary of the time. It's a postcard of that, about that period. Um, but, you know, there's this, like constant friction between those those two ideas in my mind you know right i don't know if i mean if, if, do you had any projects where you, you you felt like there's a certain trace that needs to remain even if the project falls apart but i mean yes that, that that's as a sonographer because i'm a sonographer um as a sonographer the there's like I think I think as long as there are sonographers on this planet, there are sonographers complaining that they don't get the credit that they should get for the piece for the work they did. And um, so as long as I am doing this profession, I'm also critical about like I, I was assistant sonographer and then I would I would would be assistant sonographer to someone who would then be pissed when he when when the piece is good and the, and then his name wasn't wasn't so clear he, uh, the credits were not so good and then if the but then if the piece wasn't so good then it was also like it's not my work so I was also like hmm, what is this weird position that I'm gonna be myself like here and 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 now I I I make work that is um more like commission that i make uh that on on, a, on an invitation a question and then i sometimes also make work that is really starting from a, from a from my own like from nothing and the distinction between the two is 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 uh is really big for me there is a there's a huge uh difference in in uh fra fragility i would say like it's much more fragile to start Say like, hey, I have an ID. I don't really know um, how to do it. Could you help or something? You know, like that. There's, and it helps me to to be a better. Like they they are so intertwined for me. I need to do both to, in order to 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 stay. Uh, in order to to live, yeah, I think I need to do both. Are you referring to something along the lines of like a a personal fulfillment? in order to feel fulfilled or satisfied no because if honestly if i if i would let one of the two go it would be my own work like i i but they they need each other they need each other for so many reasons like i need to somehow keep establishing a name for the whole thing to to to, to keep afloat um i need to also experience the fear and the the difficulty in order to stay compassionate when I'm when when I'm joining someone else's project, so I need both. But it's um, I'm gonna jump because there's some something in what you said that I find interesting because I said that I am interested in um, in letting my work and my position should be take shape after uh, the building and the invitation. And then you answered, you said, you, you call it ad adapting. And there's something I find interesting in that to say, because when I say take shape, I don't mean adapting. 
it's that's because adapting is a form of taking shape you know yeah you're in a cold building you take a sh you take a pullover but that's what i like and it's not a metaphor it's all also really it's like you could also start developing the practice of heavily dancing in a cold building or you could isolate it and say i don't want you to be cold or you could uh go ask funding and install heating or you could close in the winter and only open in the summer or you could make ice sculptures or you know like there's there's so much and i don't think the word adaptation covers the amount of shapes i feel i can take from an invitation from a building from a um a question what would what would you f um what word do you think would if there is one or you know a few words that might represent how you feel your your responses mm -hmm. could be I, I guess take shape has the potential of of also with take shape is also you can also i mean building a barricade inside the uh, a street is also taking shape against something is also using the form so uh, take shape and it can also be ch t taking a shape you can be water and take the shape of the of the thing that holds you but it, you can also build a dam you know that's also taking shape so i feel there is a, as someone who makes space there's quite a lot of positions and playfulness within taking shape yeah um, the one word that comes to my mind a lot is um is is action versus reaction in some in some mm -hmm. shape or form like get for me getting an invitation to do something means i'm being asked to react to an idea whether it be a space a, a question um, a, a group of uh, collaborators etc mm -hmm. whereas to, for me to 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 create an action means that the, the, I have to instigate something. The instigation needs to come from from my part, and um, and that's always been f for me. A, 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 I mean, at least that binary has always been a point of friction because it's very one. Like you were saying earlier, that you might you, you might drop your own work if you had to choose, mm -hmm. um, but 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 you need it for both things to to stay alive. I I'm. I'm not sure if I would drop my own work and only rely on uh, re reacting to commissions or, or opportunities that, that come my way. I would much, I think I'm still in the phase where I would much rather be the, you know, instigate the things that I'm passionate about, even if that's to my detriment in the end, in terms of, you know, the amount of energy that gets spent and how much. Uh, how how much personal resource needs to be invested in something like that, but then you know, back to our like original conversation about frameworks and structures and and institutions. Um, I wanted to ask you of how much do you feel like what you are creating or what you've created recently or working on now is in reaction to where your your surroundings and your environment vis-a-vis um, -vis it being an action and a desire to to bring bring an idea to to reality like an actualization um you mean like now mm. um yeah everything <laughs> like <laughs> oh, no I, I i mean you speak to me in a in a, in a funny moment because i uh Two weeks ago, I started um, going to another place in the town. Like so, for the last four years, I went to my to my atelier, which is in an old um, a fact factory in Molenbeek. And since two weeks, I'm going to the to the to the other side of town, where we started secretly. As I'm not sure if if I actually should tell because I don't want to jinx the secret. Started renting an, an old TV studio. Um, that's like a giant a giant space 50 meters on 30 meters we we rent it for almost no money which is very specific to the context of brussels that this this is possible um we promise to not do any parties there and to just keep it secret and only be there with 10 people maximum and and i'm kind of you could say building a copy of 
the other atelier there um not not really a copy not like like obsessive it's not Cynic Dutch New York it's not like that but just we printed a few recognizable elements we moved quite a bit of stuff and now the people that I worked with the last four or five years or a selection of the people that I worked with the last four four years are meeting daily over there and for me this is a reaction to the moment where I find myself in that it's it's too much that I was end of June going nuts about the responsibility of carrying an organization with people who also need more contracts and more money and more and so it was too much and then somehow I think I now just decided let's make it all let's force it into a new fiction so forcing also not following the, but just say let's let's go to another place and this new place has no pillars so the old factory is uh, is from the beginning of the 19th century, uh, 20th century full of pillars so the last four years were about like how can we how can we build around, around these... them yeah oh there's like pillars everywhere and they're, they're they're keeping the whole building so you can't cut them right so it's like oh no. and now we're for the first time in i think forever in a building that is has no pillar so it's like free free building space and that's amazing plus it's also high and it's used to be a tv studio so it's it's acoustically good amazing. when we are so used to work you know as as you go looking for freedom in the city you always end up in these old industrial spaces that have not been made for people to and this is so exceptional it's like you talk and it's apart from that it's raining inside and it's super cold so it's not a it's not fantastic but <laughs> There is something about this. So, and 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 there's a there's a close friend of mine, Barry Ahmad Talib. He's an artist from um, from Guinea Conakry who is living and working with uh, who, is, who is working with me since three three or four years, and also living in the atelier. He's doing part of the concierge tasks, like opening the door and 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 uh, um and so now we meet since one week we meet in this new space. And it changes everything. And I want to make a work with him about our friendship and also about our about uh, there's something we 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 build the way we build together is special, I think. And I want to make a work about this. And I so I'm I'm doing that there. And another thing I changed is that um, within the rehearsals of this new work, we can talk about all the stuff. That is relating to the institution. So we thought so a rehearsal can also consist of one hour talking about budgets. And emails are you know, we we project our emails big and we read, you know, like we we try to use this fiction as a space where all of the unpleasant parts of running an institution become go in the studio and not out. Mm -hmm. So the opposite of of this idea that the artist has to be in the studio away from the problems of the work of the institution and we bring it in 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 but in a new space i'll keep you posted how it, yeah. how it it's so interesting because you're externalizing the the you know you're externalizing within an internal space something that's normally internalized um, the stress of which is internalized rather than you know externalized and this is this is fascinating let's see but yeah. there I had to find a way. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm not sleeping good since a long time because of all this. So I need to find a way. I need to find a way to 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 let it merge and to. I mean, I I I have to find a way out. You are definitely not the first person that has said that to me, <clears throat> and and I would agree with you entirely as well. <laughs> About yeah, tell me. Position. Yeah, I think everybody is. Um, everybody I know who's in the arts is struggling in this, in this way. Everybody, um, everyone's overworked. Everybody's overstressed, and um, and I wonder sometimes what the point of it, what the purpose of it all is. Mm -hmm. um, I really do because, again, back to this marginality and the the kind of exceptionalism. Not not exceptionalism. Sorry that. To, to being exceptions within certain things and to, to, to ultimately be dealing with niche uh, ideas for, for small numbers of audiences and people. Um, 
I'm not. That's not to say that you know popularism and mainstream is more valuable. Yeah, that's that's not what I mean. But sometimes I feel like the amount of work everybody's doing um, is not so uh, balanced with the the um, the um, what we're managing to achieve, especially when I keep seeing the same problems and same discourses going round and round again. Um, but everybody's everybody's tired. Every, everybody's mm. exhausted, not just tired. Um, and and that's why I think you know it's really important for us to have these conversations where we can question not only or not question but interrogate like our desires and and the realities and you know what what makes those realities ultimately um mm. what kind of opportunities are afforded to who what kind of access is available um what are, what are the the frameworks of that of those of that access and of those opportunities who is really like who really has the power in those situations you know um I, I I mean, and especially the question of funding is always a is is always an integral part of that. I wonder, for example, here in Berlin, how many artistic projects would happen if the funding was not available in the mm. the way that it is available for so many things. And I wonder if we would feel any worse off because of the lack of those particular projects. Also, you know. And that's and it's a dangerous question to ask because the, the right wing uh, conservatism is slowly on the rise, and you know I'm sure budgets are going to get cut soon enough, and everybody's going to start suffering. But I I do wonder about that. I do wonder about the kind of I don't want to use the word value, but I um because I I don't I don't want to posit ideas in this kind of neoliberal capitalist terms. But I think you know how, how meaningful how meaningful are you know, certain events or actions or, or reactions. Um, right. Are they worth, are they worth the, 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 the amount of energy that is spent on making them happen? Um, I, I mean, I'm, I hear you and I, I, I'm not even interested in, in defending it or, you know, I've, I've heard too many speeches about, the importance of the fragile and, and um you know when when the pandemic hit in brussels there was a clear distinction between the organizations that could handle to work with the insecurity and the ones who couldn't and with handle i don't mean output uh, the ones who kept going there were big institutions that turned themselves into other things than than arts. Uh, that they, they, they did fantastic jobs. There were there were virtu uh, nomadic institutions that that started paying paying money to artists who had no income. Like there was incredible things. So it's not only the the the, the division was not running over small and big. Was not running over artist run and institutionalized. But there was a very clear distinction about those who could manage with un uncertainty and those who couldn't and for for me for my work and for my org organization i can fairly say that we were we invented ourselves during the pandemic we did a festival that's called uh something when it doesn't rain and the programmation was called something by this person something by this person uh i think we even had maybe something by rafat <laughs> and then it didn't happen for visa reasons i think and we had audience coming to events called something by this person there was no pressure on you have to say what you're going to do and if it rains it rains and in belgium it rains um there was no roof uh so what i'm trying to say is it really feels like a muscle to to and to be able to be sh to take shape after what's the circumstances and this yeah, a question i ask myself a lot is what can i do here that i can't do anywhere else or what can i do now that i cannot do next year what is and and this often leads me to go to the way of least resistance 
So not anti-institutional, not anti, not saying you invited me to this exhibition. I'm going to now show that you're funded. So I'm not, I have, I have a lot of respect for people who do that, but I don't, I often follow the way of least resistance, but it's, it's, it's a way of training a muscle to, that I need to, and that, 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 you know, I worked a lot in, in Tunis. Working in Tunis helped me to, to, to train that muscle. And I lost my track. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good uh, moment to bring her up. For it, um, yeah. Old. We've been talking for an hour, I guess, um, mm -hmm. beyond the, our remit. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hello. Lurker. I like I like this format of not introducing and jumping at the end. <laughs> I should use it more. Oh no, this was this was amazing. Right here. I don't know. At least I'm I'm thinking of um, like at different moments. I was thinking that I was very grateful for you to like, respond to this invitation to just speak. I felt like there was a lot of honesty that made me feel very. That made me think of like I, I really drifted a lot of times and thought about things that I had in mind. And also I think there was a there was an interesting moment where Joseph was saying that the other space had no pillars, and then Khayyam's eyes lit. And I'm like, okay, where's that going? And then Joseph was like literally pillars. I'm like, fuck, I thought that no, I said sorry, open skate. But I'm like, damn. Um like he meant literal pillars because I thought of it as a metaphor. And then when you continue speaking about it, I realized that it was also a metaphor, but also there are no pillars. And I, I don't know, I just really appreciated how, how, I don't know, it, it flowed in and out of really important questions for me about why this is being, why we, why we do this, but also the structures that we have to deal with, whether we're resisting or building or imagining. I mean, as part of my introduction to these, I usually say, hi, I'm Rafat, I'm the director of the Khan, which is part of OpenScape. But in reality, I mean, you know, because we're in conversation, but the Khan is something that I invented so that people take me more seriously when I tell them that I want to do a big project. It's not something, and also now that I'm doing the outro, uh, the Khan also enables me to be part of OpenScape in order for us to create these kind of conversations that also allow us to like uh, re for no better word, remunerate these moments of time. Like, I mean, doing these alone is something that, okay, friends just want to talk, but to be able to be professional and anyways, it's beautiful fiction works. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. I'm going to outroduce you now that everyone knows you like in your deep selves, but I will do this anyway. So I'm Rafat, I'm the director of the Khan and I'm part of OpenScape. OpenScape has been a very, very interesting project so far with partners. I think our partners are everywhere. It's an initiative by Rezo. And it started in the pandemic where we were thinking about what are we going to do to be in, to, to reclaim that intimacy. And then the pandemic ended. So we needed to figure out what to do. And so this is the fourth kind of series of public uh, events that we do. And this time it's hosted by the Khan. And it's about prototyping cultural practices, which is exactly what you've been talking about. Like, what are these experiments or how can we afford to test and fail and rethink and think out loud and complete honesty about the cultural practices we want to exercise, but also put forward. Uh, so first, let me <laughs> introduce Khayyam. Khayyam is a musician, researcher, and composer, and uh, founder of Nawa Recordings. But also for this conversation in particular, something that we didn't get the chance to discuss is Apotome, which is one of his most recent projects that I think is worth kind of integrating in our conversation that's going to happen on the 28th, because it really relates to all of this. I'm not going to talk about it. I'd rather you do. So even if you want to do that after the introduction, Take your time. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much for joining. Joseph is a sonographer and theater maker and the co-founder of Decor Atelier, which now we know <laughs> is in being questioned. Thanks so much for being part of this. And it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah. This is happily being recorded and people can check it out whenever. I received a few messages of 
joy actually people tuning in live so i think i'd share it with you too like i think it was refreshing for a lot of people so thanks like i cannot express how thankful i am